This podcast is presented to you by the Center for Writing and Communication, Ashoka University. The first question is, as you know, you were born in Dhaka and brought up in Dhaka. And you mentioned in some interviews that you had a very urban upbringing. While many of your works depict nature and the natural surroundings of Bengal and the river Padma, I find many of your photographs of nature evoking a very Jibanananda-ski trope of a critique of the anthropocentrism ingrained in history that marginalizes nature and the natural environment, while others have focused on urban life and chaos in Dhaka amidst its concrete jungle and dense population. So would you identify yourself as an essentially urban artist? And how do you identify with the countryside and the natural beauty of Bangladesh? I think when I uh, mainly meant urban artist, also meant it a little bit in a way where, you know, there are people who move to Dhaka, like for someone who can move to Delhi. But because I was born and raised here, so I live my entire life in Dhaka. My <clears throat> connection with uh, outside of Dhaka happened initially because of the, you know, the, uh, the families, like, for example, my grandparents who used mm-hmm. to live in, you know, they used to post be posted in different uh, parts of the country, mm-hmm. sometimes in the south, sometimes in the different parts of north. So, to you know, when we would have a vacation uh, or Christmas, you know, that sort of thing, we mm-hmm. would travel to see them. So, that is the thing I meant. Like, for many people who probably have grow, grew up in the villages or by the river mm-hmm. <clears throat> or in a suburb town, mm-hmm. um, I think they... And then moving to Dhaka, that has a more, you know, uh, dynamic, uh, I guess, ex- experience in terms mm-hmm. of growing up. Mine was not as dynamic. Uh, and uh, uh, city was more, obviously, you know. Uh, and also, you know, because um, I was also like, I'm, I'm also the one uh, child, right? Like, mm-hmm. I used to be the female child, so I don't have any siblings and all. So obviously, my mother was very protective of me. So I, I didn't got to also travel, even if I wanted, for to many places, which is unknown. Or like, you know, uh, mm-hmm. often friends used to go travel together or just a couple of friends uh, going. Uh, uh, that was not something they, my mom especially, would feel very comfortable about. Mm-hmm. So it's just an example of also trying to say that uh, my life was often enveloped by the city. Do I call myself an urban artist now? Um, no, I wouldn't say because it also changed, especially because I found a medium uh, which enables me uh, or which requires me also at time to time to travel. And I think uh, the time when I started it, I have started to travel so much and uh, <laughs> Like, you know, whatever travel I didn't have in my previous life, all mm-hmm. those and now everything <laughs> kind of started to happen. So obviously, <clears throat> I was curious, you know, I was curious, I was interested in uh, to get to know more about uh, not the city. Part. And I think that the relationship or I think that uh, longing to be closer to nature is a very common human uh, behavior. Yeah. Uh, I maybe due to the kind of structure and life that we are living, we have been living in mm-hmm. this world and for so many years, it uh, doesn't allow us to, I think, uh, you know, to feel that perhaps even, my, I mean, I think we have also forgotten, but I think, indeed, indeed. and I'm sure you know, it is something that is very primal. So the medium of photography, thanks to that, I don't, need to call myself an urban artist anymore or you know uh, I, I can be in many different places and build connection uh, which can, which could be so much deep even than even the places I live you know and which which teaches me to build deeper connection for example the photographic exploration that I have been doing in Dhaka since last few years has also come to a realization that I think I kind of always start, used to hated the city and kept a distance to know the city in a way. 
uh, even though I live and breathe this city. Uh, but building different connection and relationship with these different other places around the country helped me to look at Dhaka uh, and make me realize that I can also create my own you know, pocket of Dhaka. Quite nicely put. So that brings us to our second question. Do you think that you have been uh, visiting rural northern Bangladesh for the last 10 years, tracing the journey of the river Padma in various places like Ishwardi? So the natural environment of northern Bangladesh and the climate change crisis that is evident, which comes out very vividly in your photograph and which impacts the lives and livelihoods of millions of people that you encountered in your trips. So has this had a lasting impact on your practice? And if so, then how important a role do you think art plays in garnering domestic and international attention to intervene in climate action? Okay. Just to go, uh, before I go to this question, I also, I, I, I found it very nice and interesting to your uh, comparisons with the poems of, you know, Jivananda Das, mm -hmm. and which is something I, I will not say that I have read a lot of Jivananda Das, but I have read a very little of it. And, you know, sometimes you don't need to read a lot of poetry of a poem. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Sometimes you can read three poems and in somehow you can uh, get the essence. Get the essence, or mm. you know, you, you can respect that, uh, you know, perspective or admire that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have found myself lately going to the hometown of Jivanandas several times, mm -hmm. not for any specific reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, not for my personal project, but for a commission work. Mm -hmm. And it kind of build an urge to explore that town. Mm -hmm. At some point, I don't know even if I will be able to, just a footnote I wanted to share with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you for your comparison. Mm -hmm. um, coming to the second question. Uh, okay, uh, because I would just want to add before you answer that, yeah. uh, you, your co-author of, of Eastern Arts, Catherine Koenig, mm -hmm. she also suggested that uh, uh, in her works, it's through immersion, I am quoting her, it's through immersion that I can be part of a land, unquote. And in her, uh, in her work, The Crossing, there is also a sense in which each photograph offers a miniature portrait of a natural world on the cusp of disappearance. So th there are these similarities and similar threads between both of your works. So yeah, now I can answer the second question. Yeah. No, I think what he, she, one of the things that she said, uh, mm -hmm. that about how do we immerse ourselves with the place? And, you know, it is, uh, if I can just make it a bit simply, file that uh, you know in the end we are uh, the, the medium that we choose is often because we often connect ourselves to the space you know and or the visual uh, certain visual we connect ourselves to light we connect ourselves to space and, and, and I think that is something what also she tried to say you know it is as I mean, we can read a lot of things, we can research and we can write, uh, but eventually we are visual image makers, right? Either moving image or still image. And it that's how we really truly connect, you know, through light, through space and how it speaks to us, how, how, how we can create a language of communication within that existing, in uh -huh. that uh, world, right? So something is very important. Um, yeah, so the second question, as you said, um, like your travels to northern I Bangladesh, think, uh, did, did it have a lasting impact on the way you view photography and the way you view your own work? So did it essentially transform any aspect of your creative personality? Well, one, well, one thing I can, uh, if I can touch upon is that, you know, for, because I traveled so much uh, for my personal work or maybe, you know, commercial work, um, I have developed and I to acknowledge the landscape of Bengal. Mm -hmm. And I have started to develop that, which, which is a realization that I came recently. And uh, I think that is something to, um, that is something I would like to perhaps keep exploring more in future, more maybe specifically, I mean, 
because before I was often entering to different works, I mean, let's say you mentioned the work on the river, which is now spanning 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously I am very, you know, tuned with that landscape. You know, I, I can identify so many details just because I spent so much time there, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course I was working with the, the history of partition and uh, you know the migration that happened in Bengal, mm -hmm. which also allowed me to explore more, uh, you know, more over the Bangladesh, all over the places, and also these architectures of you know ruins and uh, architecture that used to exist uh, pre, uh, you know, during the colonial period, and also not uh, by the Jamidars, but also again, uh, uh, you know, for more. Uh, uh, through the railway colonies, exploring mm -hmm. these British mm -hmm. uh, uh, old towns, and mm -hmm. so, but those those all had different his either historical or environmentally entry points, right? Yeah. And through that, I kind of learned uh, more about those places. But without even those entry points, I think it is important to acknowledge what is uh, you know just as it is in. Uh, because if you think there, if you look at painting in the, in the you know, the, especially the Western history of painting and photography, uh, you see that all these different Western places, they acknowledge their landscape, they acknowledge their you know, local uh, space, you know, and that can, that can be reflected in their work, obviously. And I think these travel, travelings made me aware of these things and made me realize that one should be able to do it and explore it more anyway. Even there is not, we don't necessarily need uh, always different lengths and entry points mm -hmm. of stories, you know. So that's something I would love to explore. And I think that has created an effect because I think before that I didn't have these ideas. You know, I didn't, I mean, ideas, I, I didn't thought like that. I didn't, uh, uh, I was thinking more about different subject matter that interested me. Um, but I don't see it in also other practices that happens here. It's something that I would like to explore further. Uh, That's a very interesting that, answer. You know. I don't know if that answers your question, but it yeah. immediately made thought of, that when I it does, books. but I, I have uh, two important observations on this. Like uh, uh, you speak of a, a culture of seeing, about practicing uh, the cultivation of the practice of seeing, how important that is. You lay importance to this very much in your works. And uh, even your mentors at Patshala, they also stress how important it is to have a culture of seeing, to see properly before you compose a photograph. So, yeah, I think that aspect has uh, played a very important role, uh, as you said, if the culture of seeing that you encountered while working in beside the river Padma. So I think that uh, brings forward a very important aspect of your work that unlike uh, just going around with the camera, which, which, which also is a part of your work as you have been involved in mobile photography. But other than that, you are also uh, keenly interested in developing a culture of seeing. And the second point I would like to mention is about the railways. It's a very important uh, theme, I think, because uh, the railways, uh, in a way, it was in British India, that is what united the uh, whole of Bengal, although they were owned right. by separate private companies. But in a way, it, uh, it, uh, it was symbolic of the whole of Bengal, I think. And then the way I first uh, saw your photographs on Instagram, of uh, Ishwardi and places like this. So mm -hmm. the first thing that struck me was about the railway things, because as you know, perhaps the Hardinge Bridge, which mm -hmm. crosses over the Padma, yeah, it was bombed even during 1971. Mm -hmm. So, mm. so uh, that was, I think, yeah, railway uh, uh, does play a very important role in this, all this. And uh, Ishwardi is also important, I think, because uh, it used to be one of the uh, stations in the old- uh, the the, Yeah, the, the biggest Darjeeling. junction. In the, uh, the Darjeeling Mail Road, yeah, that connect, oh, okay. that connected North Bengal ah. and South Bengal. Okay, okay, okay. So after so partition, after partition, what again? Oh, oh, Calcutta with Darjeeling. Ah, mm -hmm. I didn't knew this this uh, route. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this, this was the main route. So after partition, ah. this was severed, and uh, the Indian Railways faced a really lot of problem 
so what to do how mm. to fix this situation then after oh. i think 20 20 25 years they built a bridge and then they mm. had to divert the whole route through bihar so now it right. takes much longer time to connect to mm. calcutta and uh, north bengal so, yeah because it's a there is a big junction and mm. and i there is this video work that i did uh, mm. which which is about well which is not necessarily about that but it it the context based uh, is about the first rail station of east bengal mm-hmm. so which used to connect uh, which first time connected east bengal and mm-hmm. uh, west bengal you know uh, before mm-hmm. and that was in kushtia mm-hmm. so i did more reading about that uh, before that how it was very crucial obviously for the british people to you know transport goods that they were you know uh, taking all over the india something but Uh, I didn't knew this fact about Ishwari. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So fascinating, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, let's move back to the partition. So my next question concerns the partition, because I am also de- descendant of refugees. Uh, my grandparents moved from Barisal. So uh, yeah, I would like to know more about what kind of stories did you used to hear about the partition as a child from your grandparents or your parents, and how that informs your practice today. So that that's the thing. So one of uh, so I obviously when I grew up. um there was hardly any talk about partition quite frankly i mean of course my grandfather is to say because they come from my grandfather my mother's uh, my because my father's pair, they passed away before so mm-hmm. i only had a you know i the only grandparents i knew was basically my mother's parents and uh, and my grandfather he obviously they they are from the north the up up most north bank like of bangladesh okay so like rongpur district which is dinachpur okay, okay right uh, dinachpur mm-hmm. like very north you know mm-hmm. and it shares the border of now mm-hmm. but obviously in their time there is no border right mm-hmm. and also they come from kuch bihar okay their origin is kuch bihar obviously mm-hmm. um and obviously when there was no border they moved just, you know for whatever reason they moved to current dirachpur and and uh, and then of course she started travel more and then bangladesh happened blah 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 mm-hmm. so i didn't know much more about that mm-hmm. but um you know, as a kid those are not things that necessarily mean anything to you yeah. what is a border to a kid mm-hmm. what is oh this is to be this country and then that what does it mean to a 10 years or 6 or 12 years kid right someone like mm-hmm. me i would love of to watch football with my grandfather um so i never had really long or deep conversations and neither he also said much because he was all, i think he was also invested more in the country anyway mm. um but that's from the very you know that that is in a family space but even in a educational space or cultural space the partition is hardly is to talk about very very few people maybe people who Uh, and also and it's also you know uh, connected with it's much complex you know it's <clears throat> let's say a huge partition that happened from this region and moved to india a, a big part of them are uh, aristocrat hindus yeah. right yeah uh, if you you know dissect it more socially and economical mm-hmm. class wise of course there are also you know Uh, middle class or lower middle class mm-hmm. in the but those natives are hardly you know you can find mm-hmm. and uh, we being from much different kind of you know social class which is uh, not just the religion but also economically mm-hmm. <clears throat> partition was never part of any discussion one thing mm-hmm. the second thing is very important which is the most important thing actually it's how the history of this land has been narrated by certain political party mm. and still being used as a propaganda <coughs> so stops at 1971 as their, yeah exactly mm. as their own propaganda so mm. nothing exists before 1971 as if <laughs> nothing happened in 1969 which also is to be a very important major event mm-hmm. uh so as if all we got is 71 and oh we should be all thankful for that and whoever was the you know founder and all uh, even though had i anyway, know i should not even say this it's mm. so risky yeah. <laughs> um so so obviously you don't grow up with those other histories you know yeah. uh, forget about alternative history mm. like if or counter history 
I mean, those are much more complex. Not complex, but let's say much more risky thing to talk about now in Bangladesh. But as I mentioned, you know, 71 has this huge thing going on. So 47 was never important to talk mm-hmm. about or never mm-hmm. prioritized. Yeah. And I think there is a huge amount of uh, lack of uh, you know discussion, dialogue, reading, mm-hmm. uh, uh, narrative uh, absence of narrative about that. Very few people tried with very a lot of limitation. I know this one Bengali filmmaker who tried many ways to. And there are many few Beng- Bangladeshi filmmaker mm-hmm. uh, uh, who can, who has been able to uh, you know focus on that theme of partition throughout his career. Mm-hmm. His name is Tamir Kabbal, but also like nobody now knows much of his work or sees his work anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. Can you tell uh, his name again? Tanvir Mukambal. Acha, Tanvir Mukambal. Okay. I have seen right. some of his work. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, there is a beautiful film called Chitra Nadir Pare, which mm-hmm. I also that I also followed that place because of my, my own project. But mm-hmm. because I went there, I got to know, oh, there's someone who made a film about this area, which mm-hmm. in the late 90s and all. <clears throat> he recent, the last work he did was, is called Shimantoreka, which explores different part of Bengal and mm-hmm. you can see that he had to work with many low budget or like you know the editing and everything is not as great but mm-hmm. you can see the research is there like the mm-hmm. the effort is there and it's sad that there's not a you know not not only financial fund but good people with enough craft in filmmaking or storytelling working in this uh, spaces so anyway so <clears throat> So that thing of that amnesia regarding partition is always there and now the more, if not, uh, I think, in any time. So uh, my uh, reading or knowing about partition happened by, uh, you know, popular writers like Sunil Gangupathai, Shamrish Hodimdar, you know, <coughs> uh, especially the trilogy by Sunil Shamrish. Mm-hmm. and all uh, and uh, mm-hmm. and these books basically when I read them I think I was in my you know first year college you know that period right? you just uh, finished school and and in that period, <coughs> yeah. huge, uh, uh, in fact as a young teenager you know <coughs> Um, it, it created this world in my head. Mm-hmm. And this is, I'm talking about uh, in 2000, around two, one and two, two, three, like this period, like uh, these three to four years, let's say from 2000 to 2004, these are the years that I read a lot of Srinil Gangapadhyay, Shamar Shumajumdar, Humay uh, you know, these uh, story tell, uh, stories, their books. Mm-hmm. That's how I actually got to know about partition and that Shunil Gangabhadra's trilogy created this world in my head. You know, there's no visual of this world. Mm. You just read and you think, you think about the, all these different characters because uh, what I also find interesting of those books was why they, I loved them so much was because history was always such a difficult subject in schools. Whoever is to teach, however it was teach, being taught, oh my God, you would fall asleep. You just have to remember different years, like numbers and names. That was all about history. So the way history and subjects, subjects like history and science are usually taught in the schools in Bangladesh, at least. You know, I think maybe there are very one, 10 percent good teachers, but all the rest are trash. And the way they are taught. It never intrigues anything as a, ch- as a child like or a teenager like mine, right? Reading both those books was the first time I felt like, oh, history is so, you know, like fascinating. And because he used mostly 90% real research history, Mm -hmm. and then he adds one or two characters, two fictional characters in them, Mm -hmm. and somehow blends them so beautifully. Mm -hmm. So you start to become those, like, you know, you start, you can imagine those characters yourself or you create these worlds. Maybe in visually, I had some, I also constructed, who knows? Mm-hmm. But the point is, I was never a visual person then, you know, like I didn't do photography. It came after 10 years, around 10 years later. Mm-hmm. So. 
Um, so my work, especially Exodus, is basically of uh, you know connection of that period of my you know reading and life and mm -hmm. world that I kind of fictionalized in my head. Uh, because I I wanted to when I read those books, it was like I was this character who was traveling through those times, witnessing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so same as Exodus, I'm witnessing these ruins, which feels like from thousand years old, which is not, which is basically two hundred years, but 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 they represent a lost, you know, obviously century, an era of Bengal. Oh, I am sorry. I think I answered too much, but no, I it's all right. about that, you know, mm -hmm. whole, uh, you know, uh, thing, the books that influence so much. No, so I think it's the case that, for every child who has grown up in the 90s. Even me, I have grown up yeah. in the 90s. So for mm -hmm. me, accessing the history of Bangladesh or knowing about Tripura and how the Tagore family had connections with Tripura and how whole mm -hmm. Bengali modernism is so much of a holistic thing encompassing the whole of Bengal and it cannot ever be pinpointed just to Calcutta and that is no. what has happened the narrative in India mm -hmm. and it might be the other way around in Bangladesh but I think uh, these books this literature do play a very important role like uh, almost anyone of my age who has read these books they say the same thing right so I think that these books are hugely we have to well, like they play so much role no, for mm -hmm. to build our whatever knowledge or interest in our life. Um, if I like, I have books like this there, and then of course science fiction, like especially Arthur C. Clarke. Mm -hmm. um, I miss those times when I could read books nowadays, hardly mm -hmm. ever. But thankfully, at least till my university days, I was able to read books <clears throat> and like, you know, any books that I want to read or whatever. Uh, and the books of Arthur C. Clarke, The Space Odyssey, mm -hmm. uh, of Sunil Gangoda, I think these are the main ingredients of my artistic practice also. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so I will uh, combine the next two questions. Uh, it concerns <laughs> 1971. So the first question is, was it tough for your grandfather, as you can remember, uh, John, who was a Christian preacher, to survive and care for his family? through the tumultuous decade before the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War and the political upheavals in Bangladesh of the 1990s. And the second question would be, how did the extended time that you spent photographing the everyday life of your grandparents, how did that uh, influence you as an artist? And how important a role do you think the private sphere has played in informing your artistic practice? Because uh, in an interview with New Yorker, you earlier said that, uh, uh, and I quote, Sometimes photography gives you more than a photograph. So yeah, if you can put yeah, some light on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's from very long time back I said mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I think probably a similar setting. And not on a Zoom interview, but uh, <laughs> for mm -hmm. sure. Maybe Skype, who knows. But, uh, before you used to Skype, I remember. You don't use Skype anymore. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think what I meant by that was, it sounds now a bit too philosophical, but or like, you know, very deep. Mm -hmm. In a way, it is actually, but um, what I meant is like, you know, <clears throat> especially in emphasizing on the second question that you asked, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you started photographing uh, someone, uh, especially who's part of family, who's very close to family, mm -hmm. and also in an interior setting, right? Like it's a very, very close, confined space, small apartment of an old couple. It's not much really to explore visually or in any other way. <clears throat> um, it made me uh, obviously not, you can't hunt moments. And I think one of the things I never was interested in photography was to hunt moment. Because that felt very, <clears throat> well, I don't. So I, sometimes I say things like that, which can be very blunt, but I don't mean in the blunt way, but um, what I mean is it's not enough for me or it shouldn't be enough for any image maker to hunt moments, you know? Like you'll see many photographers whose practice is based on street or many daily life activities. And you will see also the actions that are happening within the photograph. You know, a lot of things may be simultaneously happening and while happening, such, you know, the photographers were there 
you know uh, contemplating or like you know waiting for the right moment just or action to happen and then you have this image very un you know which blows you off and i think that character <coughs> that 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 kind of photography was never something aspiring to me let's just say that uh it was nothing enough for me to you know to explore further down and uh especially working with my grandparents in this small space it also helped me to not necessarily look i think i uh, of course moments are very important don't get me wrong we are always looking for or creating certain moments in a in a photographic image because eventually it's dealing with time right mm -hmm. a single moment in time but <clears throat> it helped me to slow down very much that era when i was started in 2000 especially in 2010 um 2011 12 i was always mostly working with a tripod because that the lack of light you know when i was, i started to photograph the night in Dhaka, which we could be a tripod i was photographing my grandparents inside the house which is not necessarily full of light so you need longer exposure to you know get a photograph so Obviously, when you set up a tripod, you fix your camera, your you know, lens, your frame, and all that, you can't catch a moment. Like, mm -hmm. you can't just pick a moment. Mm -hmm. But you have to know what you want to see, what you want to show, and what will that tell to people? You know, what does that communicate? What will that image communicate? What will it talk about? If I'm photographing the face of my grandfather, Ma or I, my, I'm photographing my grandfather sitting and watching television. So, um, so that's why, you know, instead of photographing my grandfather watching television, I probably chose to photograph the television, you know. So I don't need to explain through one single image that, oh, look, my photograph, my grandfather, uh, this is a photograph of my grandfather, a old person sitting on his couch every day and missed hours of his time <coughs> of every day watching this television. That's too explanatory. Mm -hmm. And I don't think audience are that, I think audience are smart to, you know, I always think audience can be smart. I always believe in the intellectual capability. So I chose to follow just the television. And I think that should, probably be enough to mm. communicate, you know. So uh, that whole experience photographing in a small house, which doesn't allow you to, you know, a vast world of, you know, uh, happening or exotic, uh, you know, spaces of Bengal, you know, or India in, in that Indian subcontinent, you know, mm -hmm. um, help me to look at even the corner of the room or the dust that settles on the bookshelf and to understand the meaning behind that so <clears throat> the next question is uh, your works like reshmi which is a eulogy to light and the beginning monologue in oh great life where you refer to the biblical genesis have been read by many as religious slash spiritual insignificance what is your opinion no i mean the work is obviously it deals with a lot of uh different ideas it accommodates different ideas right mm -hmm. and, and it, it it accommodates uh and you know growing up in a christian family mm -hmm. growing up in a in a in a subcontinent when where religion is still very strong mm -hmm. and obviously my both of my grandfather's family used to be you know uh, uh, pastors in church so and growing away from that also you know like uh learning other things about you know how the universe is created and all that like you have all these different narratives that yeah. go through as a child or teenager and my parents especially my mother and father they were both very different uh, you know kind of person in terms of spirituality or understanding or or, or the lifestyle they, they used to you know my mother can be considered a religious person but my father was not at all. Um, 
I, I, not that he, I, I don't think he was 100% atheist, but it would be very easy to label him mm -hmm. if somebody would want it, if they could label him atheist. Uh, anyway, um, so I grew up as a child seeing that you know, in front of me. So, and just like that, there are many other ideas and understanding and concepts in life mm -hmm. where we start to, you know, they can contradict or not support each other, mm -hmm. but they can still coexist. It's coexist. So, oh, in all oh, great life, I wanted to create, a, you know, and I'll, again, film is again very one dimensional, right? It's not like different sets or photographs. It's one narration. Whatever you do, it basically starts from a point A to Z, yeah. and uh, uh, it's time based. So, it was something I wanted to do where I can still accommodate these different things that has been happening. So it starts with uh, the most earlier narrative that we find, the genesis and, you mm. know, of the creation of Earth, and it moves away from uh, the, you know, it starts talk about, talking about Earth, uh, water, and light, and night, and, and then it goes to uh the human uh, exploration in the moon you know a big jump from there and then from moon it goes to the poetry of shukanto Bhattacharya in a famous poem obviously so that's the first few minutes and then from each of the next thing kind of either you know contradicts itself or overlaps or you know has a parallel existence um but i think uh, that's the whole idea the duality of our everyday you know, thoughts. And it's also it was also made in a point during the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that brought out a lot of elements, you know. Uh, what was happening at that point, you know, scientists, what they were discovering, um, but also was existing before, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I mean, of course, people can interpret what, they like are. when I first saw the beginning of the film, to me, it felt uh, like more of man's uh, quest for subjugating and dominating nature, but uh, which mm -hmm. man is trying since time immemor immemorial, but uh, mm -hmm. hasn't really got to his full capacity of doing so. And it has mm -hmm. its repercussions in many ways, I think. So that is what I first thought of uh, it when I first saw it, like uh, going to the moon, you are showing the clips. Mm -hmm. of, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's the thing, like, first you see uh, all these celestial objects, right, or ideas of the celestial planet and all that, and mm -hmm. then you, you again, and then you see, like, uh, human beings have, you know, in Bengali, we saw, uh, or, like, we, we, you know, we, uh, what was the word, I forgot, uh, we conquered the moon and all that sort of thing, right, mm -hmm. like, we, we had, yeah, and all that, but again, at the same time, you see a writer in West Bengal is, looking at moon mm. and seeing it as a bread because mm. of hunger, right? Mm. And he's saying specifically as such a beautiful, powerful poem, I think the most powerful poem, one of the most powerful poem in Britain ever, because th this is the poem which, which is denouncing poetry while writing a poetry, you know, it's so fascinating. <laughs> but then again, touching up on the whole hunger and also how we see beauty, you know? an act of seeing again if you think what he was doing he was seeing that is an act so what you see can become a very complex act human act mm. and how you interpret what you're seeing so he's looking at a moon and he interpreting it uh that it is not just a moon it is almost like a scorch bread why because the bread is we don't get the bread we are hungry so why do we write poetry so many things happening right in just few lines it's unbelievably powerful so um so that film is actually about this same idea i guess you know not necessarily about spirituality or science mm -hmm. uh it is not about one single thing because if it becomes that was not the point of that film yeah. then uh you know then it doesn't make uh then it becomes too narrow, yeah, for art. Yeah, yeah, it's too narrow, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Rashmi, you mentioned something about Rashmi. Yeah. I think Rashmi is a different, a little different. I think what he Rashmi has a much more anthropocene uh, ideas of anthropocene and uh, 
and the feeling of it, you know, living. And interestingly, it, it is it was done before the even pandemic, right? So the work finished and then the pandemic started. So then it was like a feeling of coming some of a future that we are now in, obviously. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So the next question is, as someone from a middle class background, how hard did you find to navigate the art world in Bangladesh? Um, I think, first of all, to do art, obviously, and call yourself as an artist, you definitely need to have some privileges uh, or probably create some privilege for yourself. Uh, I call myself artist uh, and I build this privilege also by working, making commercial works, perhaps, you know, earning some money to uh, invest to create my own artworks, right? Um, but of course, you know, it's a, it's basically a practice, right? Uh, whoever can afford to leave that practice, whoever, uh, many people have many talents, right? But we don't hear someone from the slum just becoming an artist. Uh, or if we find that, that becomes a kind of like a, a stunt, you know, that is used often as a so stunt by the media and all that. Um, but obviously it's challenging uh, to become an artist any part, especially in our part of the world, for sure. And obviously Bangladesh, but there's not an existing art market or anything uh, like that. As maybe one or two event has been happening last few years, but none of that has developed a market. For example, in India, you have a bigger art market, but it's, it, it's difficult, you know, it, obviously it's, uh, I mean, you have to put a lot of effort on it. So then the question, uh, at one point, the question becomes, I mean, first when you start, it's obviously very, you are naive and all that. Um, and you're very passionate and inspired and all that. So you do a lot of things, but eventually you start to become more familiar with yourself or understand the field. You don't know, okay, what makes what and uh, uh, but then the question is, what do you find more comfortable, right? So uh, those efforts become sometimes can become a lot then, a lot uncomfortable for people like me uh, then to actually make it, make the art, you know, like. <laughs> so sometimes I choose more than that, but that's also important to be established and, uh, you know, exist in a, as you mentioned, in the art scene. Uh, but it's it's damn difficult. I know many friends of my contemporaries or you know young my stu I have a lot of students who are very you know, have done many good works. And if I compare to uh, in many other countries in let's say in the West, perhaps nobody has seen their work. But I see a lot of people from the West whose work not necessarily that good. But you see they have books and this and that. Uh, it, I don't make want to make it sound complaining. I'm just saying how the reality is. You know, it's just not balanced, obviously. Yeah. The and not just in art, anything. The global, uh, you know, thing. The the globality of our world. Is white never white privilege makes its way. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. Obviously, mm -hmm. that those exist. And then even in our countries, like India and Bangladesh. I mean, even if you look at in India and, <laughs> and the Indian art scene, I mean. It's a hell of a privileged, yeah, huge, indeed, huge indeed, money people, right? Yeah, and people like me, we don't come from that sort of space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it it is uh, also a question of feeling. Mm. I think this is a problem in whole of South Asia. It's full of elitism and nepotism and what yeah, it's very, yeah. I mean, Art world is elite. I mm. sometimes, uh, you know, in Instagram, you follow certain mm -hmm. spaces. Uh, you know, uh, pages like, you know, uh, galleries pages or other pages and the things that they post, the way they post and the activities they do, they're like, whoa, that's like, even the young artists, even they are like quite privileged. I'm like, wow, that's like, I wish I could have that. Or like my, mm -hmm. art, you know, my students in Bangladesh mm -hmm. would have even 20% of that. But yeah, but hey, hey, that's the, that's, I mean, you know, we don't have time to think, yeah. think about that thing. If you keep thinking about it too much, you there's no point. You need to make yeah, your yeah. own work. Indeed. So that's bring, that brings us to our next question. You have been mentored by stalwarts like Shahidul Alam at Parshala. So uh, would you consider your works as political? Well, I, I don't think I would want to also 
call myself political in that same sphere. Mm. I don't think uh, it's we, you know, I have been taught by many great, uh, you know, uh, inspiring people, Abir Abdullah, Munem Wasif, Shahidul Alam, mm. and, and also uh, not just here, but abroad too, like I got to know people, not necessarily maybe they taught me, but I got mm-hmm. to probably spend time uh, learning from them. And, and uh, so, and obviously there was a time uh, what Shahidul uh, has done all throughout his life was also a very common practice in our school uh, in terms of storytelling, in terms of aesthetical choice and all that. I don't think I was ever uh, aspired to that. Probably that become, that is to do with my own background, where I come from, you know, how I, how my upbringing was. You know, again, that's another discussion of personal taste, childhood, uh, family, uh, economical upbringing, a lot of things. So uh, I might not be aspired by their photographic work, but I am hugely, I was hugely inspired by their commitment to their work and what they do, what they did to the larger community, what Shaidu did to the larger community, finding students like Abir Abdullah, how Abir Abdullah has made, you know, has taught, gave back to Patsala in many ways and had students like Munem Wasif, uh, you know, and uh, many others. And same way how Munem Wasif has also taught and gave back. You know, I think that is something that I respect. And and uh, regardless of their individual practice, those are the uh, active participation that was much much impactful in someone like my life uh, and 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 i yeah yeah <clears throat> okay so tell us more about your passion and background in music and how that informs your practice what kind of music have influenced you also in an interview with foam you mentioned how the electronic music scene in the 60s and 70s which signified a move away from structures and grammatical forms to a more noise and sound based grain which created its own rhythm and harmony, and that greatly influenced you as a musician and as a visual artist. So tell us more about how you got introduced to electronic music. Um, I think uh, in the 60s and the 70s, electronic music was pioneered in Eastern Europe. What exactly were you listening to? Which bands or which musicians? Well, I mean, what I when I started listening, it was mm-hmm. obviously post-2000, right? Like okay. So in fact, actually more after 2010 rather mm-hmm. than post uh, uh, so obviously I heard them in a period when they have already existed in the world 50, 60 years, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but be, uh, going back to before, uh, I mean, you know, I, how it all started is because my mother used to sing and my father was avid listener. But again, like just like the religious practice, their taste of music was also very diverse, like uh, different from each other. Mm-hmm. I think I was more in, so my father, I remember my father used to listen to Doors, you know, Leonard Cohen, um, you know, 60s, 70s, maybe some 80s, you know, that time, Beatles and that was, you know, uh, classic rock, you know, and uh, and that that was, a, uh, or someone like Dylan, uh, not, I think Dylan less, more Cohen, I think Leonard Cohen was his favorite, but, but, but also many other, I, I might not say it now, I forgot. But so I kind of go give up listening to that music, even knowing who they are, or what kind of genre they come from. And uh, so for a long time, I, I have developed. Is it too loud, Dajan? No, it's fine. I can hear it. Okay. <coughs> so, um, but obviously, as I slowly, you know, grew up and I, I in my teenage years, I started to develop my own interest in music. So I think I think many like many other young people in the nineties or you know early yeah nineties basically you know I started to listen to band music you know rock and roll heavy metal and you know that tra- tra- trajectory you know but then again coming back to the classic ones and then going back to more classical music you know uh, or classic classical musicians and then again listening to pop music and this music and that music and then eventually kind of finding out electronic music. I think the electronic musicians I started to found out was more uh, started in the 60s, 70s, especially also in the new age, you know, 
uh, the artists like John Cage uh, and many other in the US and some in Europe, in Germany, in US. That circuit. Um, uh, John Gibson was someone I really liked. Then um, uh, there's this. Uh, there's so many uh, Juan Baruch. Uh, there's so many artists who were never really. I mean, obviously, it's a very not a popular genre. First of all, like, and then there's so many artists who work in that period who, you know, who I discovered in the last five, 10 years, you know? Um, yeah. And then that, that opened up a different kind of role. And then there are artists who have blended electronic music with classical music and popular music, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how you get to know all these you know, inspirations of, that, of how they're also taking up different movements from different mm-hmm. time and trying to build their own signature with it, right? So that's one thing about that. But in general, I think music is music, you know, uh, and sound is sound. And um, because of, uh, also I used to, because practice it. So my first art discipline in any form of art is mm-hmm. music. So by that learning instrument, learning how to play it, learning how to play with other people's song, learning slowly to write your own song, not lyrically only, but musically. So that was a very intense practice that I lived in my, you know, at least eight years of before I came into photography. Um, so these both were very different in terms of one only deals with the visual world around you, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the other one has no visual, you know, element. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very mysterious, you know, actually. So, uh, but there are still um, similar approach in, can be similar approach in, in, because, you know, your brain is basically, a, you know, how you wire your brain, mm-hmm. it will obviously affect your work. So I don't think that eight years of practice in music, if I hadn't done, my photography wouldn't be like what I do now or have been doing now, right? So, mm-hmm. because my brain has been wired in a certain way, of thinking of in terms of idea, in terms of editing, composing, you know, composing a photographic work or, or editing a, you know, a, a video work, you know. So that definitely informs my larger practice. I'm, yeah, I'm a bit distant from it. I mean, I listen to it, of course, but my practice of that medium has, uh, the last time I did was on Poor Great Life mm-hmm. intensity. Thanks to the pandemic, I was only at home, so I had a chance to, you know, do all that. <laughs> uh, but I'm a bit distanced from that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so the next question is, uh, your works have from the very beginning moved beyond traditional photography to incorporate various practices of installation art and video. So do you feel expanding your practice beyond traditional photography has enabled you to enlarge the scope of your work and do you see and want to develop your work in the future within the larger ambit of expanded visual art practice, as they call today uh, in the West? What was the last part? Exactly, just the last line. Can you say that? Yeah. So, do you see and do you want to develop your work in the future within the larger ambit of expanded visual art practices? Okay. So, um, I think uh, the. It, it's kind of connected with what I was mentioning before. Uh, yeah, and and if I may uh, just add uh, before mm-hmm. you answer, uh, because mm-hmm. uh, uh, in astronauts we saw that many of those photographs were taken with a mobile phone <laughs> at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, although uh, the whole book is a very digital approach, many critics have said that uh, you, in a way, have actually reversed the whole process of photography because in traditional photography. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a film when the light is cast and the photo is made. But here what you have done is while printing, you are doing it on a, a silver ink on a black paper and it evokes the essential material of film photography, which is silver salt. So mm. although your works are digital, they retain the luminance of the screen through print. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very much a reverse cycle. So was this intentional? It, so the credit has to be go to the publishers in this case because I mean if I would make that big book all by myself and maybe even Catherine too we, I don't know if we would do that I don't think 
our intention when we produce those images to reverse the you know the practice of film and all that mm -hmm. but what we were definitely into was the essentiality of light especially in terms of photography itself the medium itself you know mm -hmm. like i mean it is based medium based on light and time if mm -hmm. i can add but Technically, if you think how does an image is produced, it's on you know obviously of light on a uh, on a surface which is chemical or you know digital. So we both worked with a phone basically. Um, not that we uh, I, because I mean I don't I can't speak for Catherine, but I think she might agree too. But for me, I started photography actually with a phone. That's how I got to first take pictures and and. So my I uh, no, this is not same for Catherine. That's why I'm not speaking mm -hmm. on behalf of her. I know Catherine has started a long time back, and she and still is very much a film person. Mm -hmm. I, on the other hand, I never had like, access to film camera, or you know, I couldn't afford, of course. But and also, it's not very available anymore when I started, right? Mm -hmm. So my the, the the time that I started, all that 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 represents the digital era, and phone more than any time is the most intimate device that mm. we carry not only as a camera but definitely the most intimate camera mm. you know and as an uh, extension I, of ourselves basically yeah it's an extension mm. i mean not just in terms of photographic image mm. i mean it is a device that is now an extension of our body and mm. especially our brain right and then what is the most intimate device a camera device is obviously phone it's not this camera this mm. is something i carry consciously mm. you know uh, anywhere i go but uh, or choose to carry phone is i'm carrying anywhere mm. so it allows me to also explore all that i so uh, my intention was not to any you know reverse any process or push, you know address certain photographic process i think that was something that probably the publisher felt were more interested if I made the book, I might not even do that. Mm. And uh, yeah, I like, uh, but we were very much open in experimenting and trying something new around that point in 2016, uh, you know, and, and in, in different stages of your career or practice, you know, you, you look at things differently. Sometimes you are more interested in the experimental. And once you do a lot of different kinds of experiment, you also learn to appreciate or slowly find yourself back to the more simplistic approach to things. So if I made the book, I would probably make in a very traditional black and white paper, right? Mm. Um, but not my intention as an artist was to do that, mm. what you asked. And, uh, Regarding the and other then, part, uh, yeah. So uh, 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 how do you see it like uh, about installation art and video about this being 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 an essential part of your practice? So do you want to work in the future more on such kind of art? And uh, tell me also about uh, uh, the format of the trip teach, why it is so important to you? Because I, as a uh, viewer of your art, I find it very much uh, sensorily immersive because of the trip teach screens, the use of the three screens together. In Rashmi, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So... Um... There are two answers for those. One, so because as I mentioned, no, because before I used to make music, right? So mm. I always feel like the sound has so much strong presence. Even you can see nothing or close your eyes or the screen can be blank, but you can hear a sound and it can be sound of water. It can be sound of wind. It can be a sound of someone walking and their boots, you know, whatever it is. You don't need to see, but they hear it and you start to build this world like you're reading a book. You don't necessarily, you know, see image. Uh, so I kind of, as much as I love the, you know, medium of photography, I also can slowly see that where it lacks, you know, where it has its limitation and sometimes where that limitation can be its own beauty too, right? So, um, and I was also having this arts to create something where I can have sound and, you know, use image. And obviously, naturally, that can happen when it's a more video or installation space, right? So that's that is why my uh, you know practice kind of evolved to that direction. Mm -hmm. 
So you can say that I practiced music and sound in my first eight years. And then now almost 12 years of visual making. Mm -hmm. So 20 years, <laughs> 20 years of my first half of my life, I spent either in creating sound or creating image. And that's the blend of many of my installation now that you see. Mm -hmm. And probably it will, you know, uh, it will continue to uh, expand in the future. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so, what led to this collaborative project between you and the Australian photographer Catherine for Estress Noise? So, it was again the publisher who kind mm -hmm. of, uh, well, I mean, we, not that we didn't knew each other, we are very good friends already. Mm -hmm. But the publishers felt that they can. You know, obviously at that point, I mean, always for a book was always about one author, right? So they, they had this idea of kind of bringing two author and mixing them up mm -hmm. and, and, and create a language which becomes, goes beyond than a vision of a single author. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's again credit to them for being, we, we, I think both of us are such artists. We are so immersed in our <laughs> daily practice we mm. hardly think of mm. much oh we can do make a book or mm. we reach out and publishers and make book thankfully we are lucky that the publishers reach out and ask us and because we already had a good friendship you know we didn't have any issue i asked Catherine, do you are you okay with this i'm fine i guess mm. <laughs> and she said yeah yeah of course mm. so then 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 the dialogue happened then we start with our existing images which were all we were just creating mm. by ourselves in both different cities or realities you know mm. and uh, and then we still had a couple of months left to go to the production so we thought we let's make more and see you know mm. you know so that's how the book came about so that brings us to the last two questions of this interview. Uh, what are you presently working on and any future projects that you have been ideating on? Any future pro projects that? That you have been ideating or planning on. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. off the record, I have been so busy with this, uh, obviously this one commercial work I was doing and then I just got married. Mm -hmm. So even the most simplistic marriage you want to do because you know my partner will come i have to renovate the house and this and that so last few couple months at least i felt like i was working as interior designer mm -hmm. and all day and night i could think of only furnitures and uh, spaces in the house you know and light in the house so i was so immersed and that's the thing like you know the same way i was immersed in my work i was so immersed in this thing uh, now it's just finished i don't I feel very distant of with my art practice and I don't know how to get back to it. It's like, <laughs> um, but um, now I'm becoming on the record so that you understand where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very much doing till December and January. I was simultaneously uh, working on a commission work, but at the same time shooting and traveling a lot uh, for the Exodus work and the river and bo both a lot of new materials of the same work mm -hmm. i still haven't got to go through them like you know going through the digging the archive and you know structuring mm -hmm. the new materials and structuring the work uh, i'm hoping to do start doing that uh, mm -hmm. from this month obviously um, i'm working uh, on a a group exhibition of participants from South Asia uh, who were doing a mentorship program arranged by Patshala and Seven, which for which I was the course leader. Um, so their work has been done and we have photographers from Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, young crops of photographers. And um, so we'll make an exhibition in Dhaka in August. So I have to yeah, I'm trying to, I'll be curating, obviously, so I have mm -hmm. to uh, think uh, the work now in terms of exhibition. So this would be uh, in, uh, 2023? No, no, this year. Okay. okay. So they did the yeah. whole program already mm -hmm. last year, like mm -hmm. from 21 to 22, mm -hmm. and now it will be a presentation as mm -hmm. an exhibition. Mm -hmm. So that's something I have to work on. 
anything new well um i do want to work with like in a separately or in a much different way perhaps with the real colonies mm-hmm. bengal mm-hmm. um i do want to explore borishal as given on the city mm-hmm. or uh, not city but you know uh the district you know, uh-huh. the villages regarding railways i just want to jump in here and add uh, even uh, you must have heard of vinod bihari mukherjee the uh, painter from bengal the modernist artist who used to paint no 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 please yeah so please even in his uh, childhood uh, because uh, the uh, in his autobiography i have uh, read that the railway colonies because uh, his uh, elder brother had a transferable job in the british indian railway and they used to move around this railway colonies so otherwise he was a very calcutta centric metropolis centric boy he had a very urban upbringing but these small breaks that he used to get when he visited the railway colonies in the countryside of eastern bengal uh, like, um, in places uh, like in rajshahi district some places and others uh-huh. um, so uh, the, that had a very uh, huge impact on him as an artist and this is the case for many i think so railway colonies is a very vital Uh, thing about uh, railway colonies in the perspective of uh, of bengali modernism or even contemporary art practice i think hmm. that's the thing you know hmm. so i not just the artist you mentioned but also you know historically or culturally as i am not from a art but like you know i didn't read art history or or history in general and my exploration of these places may you know became profound because of my travelings and uh, real life you know experiencing these places mm-hmm. uh, like now maybe i know all oh, the importance of these places or the relevance or the what it represents like what era it mm-hmm. represents what kind of uh, authority it represented and all that right mm-hmm. but when i go there i am like a you know i i'm i'm in a different time i find myself as a kid in a yeah. different time yeah. so another important so, place in northern bangladesh would be saithpur i think yes and that's the my target so i was able to go there that there are places because saithpur has the huge mm. rail station mm. and recently someone um, i also met mm. because it's very, they're very restrictive they will never allow anyone with a camera mm-hmm. um but i have i know they have Yes, really they still have those some of those architecture spaces you know mm. like there is one place i'm working a long time in bakshi shabdi which you can there are places there is one place which there is no access but mm. a lot of the uh, around it's you know i think uh, bakshi is the exact place where binod bihari mukherjee also used to stay as a child i forgot the name yeah now wow, you know okay, okay. bakshi <laughs> yeah yeah and it's such a beautiful place you know mm. like i I love Ishwarji so much because that's where I started to work on, uh, uh, you know, the river, and then I found Bakshi there too. Like it's in the same district, obviously, and Podda. Like I saw in Podda, I saw the Harding Bridge, and I found this small rail station, and then a beautiful rail colonies and mm-hmm. the landscape around it. So, I'll I'll share a Instagram post which I wrote. Mm-hmm. Uh, I you can mail me. I will share your email address. I, my yeah, email yeah. I think I have it on my Facebook, perhaps not on Instagram, but. Mm-hmm. um i love so a lot of my uh, interest grew actually from my own exploration you know mm-hmm. and later realizing oh this actually like for example even today talking with you i got to know that ishardi was the hub of mm-hmm. you know like uh, not hub said the connection point to yeah. uh, Dar- darjeeling you said or yeah north bengal and calcutta so darjeeling was used to be the summer residence of the british administration right. so, yeah right 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 so, so uh and also you know another thing i want to ask you maybe you can help me later on mm-hmm. like you know you have this dream so i also want to travel mm-hmm. not only in the bengal of bangladesh part but also mm-hmm. west bengal mm-hmm. and photograph of uh, the uh, old rail colonies yeah. or mm-hmm. stations you know mm-hmm. and if there's any if you know yeah, yeah there are lots of places I here are, I, I, i don't know if you uh, know about uh, much about north bengal because lots of uh, artists from bangladesh when they visit west bengal they generally just go to the southern part of west bengal calcutta and all but if you come to right, north right, bengal right. Th- through uh, uh, through the uh, bangla bandha border in panchagar mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. if you come through that to shilugulis fulbari so from fulbari jalpaiguri mm-hmm. uh, fulbari itself is in jalpaiguri district so it's around uh, like 1 km from jalpaiguri 
Okay. And other than, other than that, uh, another uh, railway service is starting from uh, from uh, this Poyla Boishak, I think. Uh, Mitali uh, Express. Yeah, Mitali Express mm-hmm. will be going through this Holdibari Chilahati route, the Nilfamadi route. Okay. It, okay. It, it will go to Dhaka, from Siliguri to Dhaka. So. Uh, I think my path is uh-huh. aligning over the years yeah. because I'm mostly spending in North Bengal my time, right? Like mm-hmm. not mostly, but you know, most of my travel and mm-hmm. interest lies there. Either it's Rail Colony or River or even the Jamidar houses. Mm-hmm. I just came from Rangpur uh, in February. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw this photo of this beautiful ruin of uh, Jamidar. And, uh, and I think my path will eventually head to the North like yeah. the north north bengal and the west mm-hmm. bengal part um then i i will definitely reach you out for information yeah sure sure please don't that's like that's, that's like the romantic part of my be my being as an artist you know you imagine i will travel from yeah. this bengal to that bengal you know photographs explore experience mm-hmm. these places but the real life is so tough you know it's mm-hmm. so difficult to, for me to travel within the bangladesh manage yeah. time but let's see. There's mm. no rush. Yeah, <laughs> we'll <get there>. take <laughs> your time. <laughs> okay. So the last question is: uh, uh, Modern uh, contemporary art practices in Bangladesh in the last thirty years have been very diverse, with a lot of varied developments. So, as a contemporary artist, how do you situate yourself in that milieu? And you also teach at Patshala. Do you? What do you think of Bangladesh's new generation of photographers? Uh, how promising do you reckon them to be? Well, the last, uh, I mean, the first one that you asked, I, it's, I don't think I have ever really thought about that much personally uh, to be able to answer you. Like, I think reading your question when you think, huh, what do I think about that? Like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I can be a bit, uh, yeah, aloof in, in, in this regard. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that happens. Mm. So once as an artist, you are totally engrossed in your work. So it becomes right. very and, hard uh, to take cognizance right. of the milieu. Right. Uh. Right, right. No, um, that, but also I think, you know, it, I think sometimes when I introvert, right, I, mm. I think, and I, this is not something I'm probably answering you on the record or like mm-hmm. probably the exact answer, but I guess, you know, uh, growing up as an introvert and uh, a certain way of being mm. you, you can be more immersed in the work that you do rather than the larger scene yeah. and not that i don't think of lar- the larger scene nowadays but I, I mean obviously when you work in industry for long you, you kind of find yourself sa- surrounded by that anyway. Mm-hmm. I think Bangladesh uh, art has been the art in Bangladesh maybe industry wise or financially has not been that good mm-hmm. for many years still not for artists but there is definitely a big group of young artists for mm-hmm. offers who are uh, picking up different way of you know uh, for example the photography has shifted how it used to be before in the 90s or in the 2000, you know, and then uh, I think post 2010, um, it has shifted a lot. Mm. Um, but uh, it is also very challenging. I, I, as I was mentioning before, like, like for any artist, I think the challenge after their school, either art school or patshala, you know, is to be able to continue their practice. You can be a great, good student. You can mm. be, uh, you know, you may produce good work as a student. But once you're not student, you're basically a professional. Yeah. And if you have to earn your living also, like, you know, mm. then how do you manage to do that? Mm. Does your own practicing art allows that? Or do you do other things to also earn a commission, you know, and or do your work gets a gallery or be sold to collectors, you know, a lot of things. And I will not say it's so easy, easy, easy f- present or a future, you know, uh, anytime soon. Um, because it relates with also the whole geopolitics, huh? like where we are. Mm. And as a country, we are going through such price hikes, Bangladesh, you know, mm. 
obviously so much corruption was going on people has never been this poor mm. and the very small amount of rich has never been this rich yeah so let's say 2% of these very rich people becomes interested in art mm. and they buy artist work maybe mm. that's good for artists mm. <laughs> I don't know how good that for the ecosystem of art, but um, yeah. And tell me about your students. You find them to be. Oh, my students. So um, uh, I I have been teaching mm. for last eight, thirteen, so at least uh, uh, fourteen, six, almost uh, eight years. Exactly eight years. This will be eight years, and I have exhausted myself. Mm. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I kind of started to teach immediately after I uh, finished my studies too. It was, all, it was also because I wanted to stay connected with this medium and working with other artists, um, which is usually not how usually for other people it works. You know, people finish their studies and they probably they at least work five to more than five years and then maybe come to teaching. So I feel like now, even though I've been teaching for last eight years, I have become, I was still a student. And after I take a break, probably I will actually only get time to work with my own projects and not simultaneously invest my energy to other group of artists. And maybe at some point later in future, I will come back hmm. and check in. But for now, I think I've done what I could do. Yeah. And I, this time period, there has been many students that was a pure joy to work with and to great to see them, their work developing, you know, uh, some of their work, you know, when they're showing different places, that's a good feeling. But we also have to understand there is always students who are lazy yeah. <laughs> and they don't work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, at the end, it's also a question how much of your own energy you want to invest to others rather than to yourself, mm. you know? Um, so I see a lot of the students, uh, some of them are working, uh, like still making work. And I hope that they can still keep continue to make work because life happens. Mm. You need money, you need, if you need to support your family or yourself or whatever, uh, you know, people lose track or decides to leave that track. Yeah. So I'll see, let's see next five years, how many of them actually <laughs> consistently make yeah. work. You know? Okay. Uh, I missed one question. So I will answer. This, this would be the last one. So uh, tell me about uh, how you see your art in the uh, context of it being a kind of uh, performance, as you have said before in some interviews, that uh, just like performance, a visual artist also performs, be it through light, be it through sound. So, I, 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 and a major part of your work was focused on uh, the BFDC at Dhaka, Bangladesh Film Development Corporation, I think. Uh, so shooting about uh, film sets and uh, the, all the accessories of uh, film shooting. So, uh, yeah, throw so some light on uh, your experience of uh, being involved with the uh, film sets and the BFDC scene in Dhaka. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, the first part, I don't exactly recall if, like about the performance mention. Mm -hmm. Mm. I don't truly recall the context, perhaps, like in which context I was saying it. Mm. But I do can say that for me, it's about also creating an experience to the audience, right? Yeah, yeah. And what you do with that, it can be a physical room, it can be um, uh, just with prints, it can mm. be with light box, it can be with video projection, it can be with sound, it can be your virtual screen mm -hmm. and uh, watching a film like Crush Me. Well, although it was not meant to see in a laptop, it is meant to be a big projection, but then again, pandemic mm. and uh, the war, which all deals with a lot of screen and virtuality, kind of transformed itself also in a screen too, mm -hmm. which is fine. So, but then it still creates an experience, right? Mm -hmm. How we consume, you know, how we consume image, uh, how do our attention span works mm -hmm. and all that. So, um, visual, my practice or I think any photographer or visual art practitioners, I think eventually we would want to create an experience. We do want to create, either it can be turning the book page as you saw in Astronaut, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we were creating experiences. So, uh, that is an important aspect 
and I would like to emphasize on that more for sure. Um, because you are, while you are making your experience a lot, yeah. so if you can't transfer that experience even a little bit to the audience, then it does it doesn't become fair to the yeah. ex park itself, no. So uh, that's the first question. The second question was the cinema. Well, yeah, that was a very exciting time when I worked there, and I don't think if I could work there now. Or I have that wavelength to work there now. Around that time, I was working something on about Dhaka, mm -hmm. and uh, found myself working there. Like you know, it came up in some way, and I I enjoyed it a lot. But mm. it's a very different kind of space. Yeah, right? very surreal. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah, it's a, mm. and also the way, the pace of work, the the, the language of professionalism and all that you know it's not uh, it's definitely different but um, yeah for me it was it was a very important uh, um, journey to be able to see that and uh, even though first about cinema there is a lot of elements that I uh, photographed probably humorously but that has a very strong real ground connection with our reality in Bangladesh. Yeah. That is to the violence mm. and how women gender. Yeah. Are placed mm. in the, I don't know if you know about Kurimuni, uh, what happened in last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of public uh, attention. I, I was photographing mm. her also, you know, and I mm. was photographing her while she was in her first cinema. She was not like not famous or known yet. Mm. <laughs> Now, obviously, she's a big shot. Hmm. Um, but it, so I think after looking back, I think last year I was looking back at that work, especially it was shown at Yokohama Triennial mm -hmm. by Rux Media Collective. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think last time I showed that I had a lot of like several exhibitions, one including in Delhi. Mm -hmm. But at one point, I didn't want to show that work anymore. After a long time, I showed it in 2020 uh, at the Yokohama Channel. And, and then I started to kind of be, you know, in your own work, you can look back and you find new elements, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you did, uh, when I did it, it was in 2014. It's now six to eight years back. So I mean, I have much more different complex lens now than mm -hmm. I had before. A lot of things I did then was unconscious perhaps or I could not know that what I'm saying now can really have a profound meaning after five to eight years, right? Mm -hmm. So that happened with that work. And uh, if I start, if I would do that, let's say, uh, again, I start that, mm -hmm. I think the work would go to many other interesting direction. But at the same time, as you said, the experience of the, the stamina you need to be able to, and also excess, yeah. you know, people trust each other only less nowadays. When there's, you know, when someone stays in power for longer than they're supposed to, mm -hmm. then there's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of, you know, uh, untrust that creates overall in the nation. And now Bangladesh was never so difficult to photograph before. I was being, you know, threatened. I have been kidnapped. I've been taken. And these are not like exaggeration. I have been taken away. Okay. Uh, to, uh, for example, in the when I was working on Podda River, mm -hmm. because there are these elements of sand mining. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. All controlled by the ruling parties, mm -hmm. goons. And uh, not goons, I mean, they are MPs and ministers, yeah. literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's so many things I happen, and I'm not even a journalist who is going no. for some controversial conflicting. I'm just a very traditional mm -hmm. image maker. Yeah. Uh, I have never been denied access or threatened or uh, threatened of violence even also before, like what happened in the last four to five years in Bangladesh. Hmm. So I don't even know even if I go and I get permission to work in these sets or industries, you know. It was complicated. It was, I was also lucky to find, make my way to talk with the directors and hmm. blend in with the crew and not 
create any outsider impression mm. uh, but this is a huge it is a packed people you know mm. because most of the people who work there doesn't really earn much they really work for many years for whatever passion they are driven by or desire they are driven by uh, so you have to respect that um, and that doesn't mean they will always be respectful for to you or other people mm-hmm. uh, I'm happy what of what I did and what of where my experience. Mm. I don't feel like I am in that mind space anymore to uh, explore that. Mm. It's a, it's become a very dangerous job, so especially in yeah, recent years, also, as you were saying. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, not the film. I'm not meaning the film industry. It's like the people mm. doesn't allow you with the camera anymore. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. I, I can understand that. Even what yeah, you said yeah. about Saitpur, that you need a permission to photograph. I can't yeah, imagine yeah, yeah. that you would need a photograph to uh, permission to photograph a railway colony. So right, right, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. I mean, yeah. So um, I, and you are not the only that, one who is saying this. Lots of my friends in Bangladesh they say the same thing that Bangladesh right. is uh, yeah, getting yeah, really right, closed right, and yeah. narrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Mm-hmm. I think I can still manage. Actually, now I will not be able to uh, get access. uh like i kind of get got access informally you know like i talked my way through those mm-hmm. sets you know there were all many different film sets yeah. run by many different directors so mm-hmm. some directors didn't allow me some directors did <laughs> and uh, but actually i now have more connection which i can exploit to get in there mm-hmm. but also it's just the overall energy mm-hmm. yeah and the chaos that place offers is not i i think i'm old now to be able to do that <laughs> not at all <laughs> okay so that brings us to the end of our interview and right, thank you right. for your time shakar pratik no uh, thanks it was lovely to talk with you